and welcome to today's live webinar, Being a Profession, Helping Principles Become the Lever of Change, Part 3. My name is Susan, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please contact WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience today. However, due to privacy concerns, the attendee number and list is not shown for all attendees. All attendees will remain in a listen-only mode throughout the presentation. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. We will have a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You can ask an online question anytime throughout the presentation today by simply clicking on the Q&A panel located in the lower right corner of your screen. Type questions in the text field and hit send. Please the send to default as all panelists. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I'd like to introduce your moderator for today, Ken Chenoweth. Ken, you now have the floor. Thank you so much. To be a successful leader of any school, but particularly a high poverty school, requires a deep belief that all children can be successful. Belief needs to be informed by the knowledge of how to help teachers be successful with each child in their classroom. Today we're going to talk with an instructional leader who has learned a great deal about how schools can help children be successful and how to build the knowledge and capacity of the teachers in our school. As principal and superintendent, Terry Burkeen led the tiny little one room, uh, one school district of Cottonwood, Oklahoma, where half the students are, African uh, are American Indian, Two-thirds come from low-income homes, and about 30% of the students have disabilities. Once there, it became one of the highest performing schools in the state. She has been asked to bring these kinds of results to scale throughout the state of Oklahoma. What she has to say will be of interest to educators around the country. But before we start, let me introduce myself. I am Karen Chenoweth, writer-in-residence at the Education Trust. Here is Christina Theokas, who is Director of Research at the Education Trust. Together we wrote Getting It Done, Academic Success, Leading Academic Success in Unexpected Schools. Hello, Karina. Hi, Karen. I know both of us and everyone is thinking of the people of Boston and those who were injured in yesterday's horrific attack at the Boston Marathon. I just want to mention how grateful we are to many public servants and volunteers who help those in need. We're thinking of them even as we continue with our webinar. As many of you know, it is the mission of Ed Trust to improve the academic achievement of all children, but particularly children of color and children who live in poverty. Part of our work here involves learning from schools that are doing an especially good job educating children of color and children who live in poverty. We are happy to be partners with the Wallace Foundation, who not only supported the key research that establishes the importance of school leadership, but is engaged in a major effort with six districts to try to systematically develop the school, the, the school leaders our, our schools need. Today's conversation should be of interest to anyone grappling with questions of how we can help all our students, particularly those who live in poverty and isolation, a great deal, as, as well as how we, can, how we can help all teachers learn what is necessary to teach them. Well, Carrie, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Good afternoon. So, um, the way this webinar is going to work is that the three of us will talk about your statewide efforts to ensure that all children are le reading at a high level. To our audience, I want to say that we welcome questions at any time, and Christine and I will monitor these questions as we go, and I'll try, we'll try and work them in. So we're trying to squeeze into this camera here, um, the camera lens. Um, we're going to monitor the questions as we go along, uh, and we'll introduce them as they're are appropriate to the conversation. And, but in about 40 minutes, Christina and I want to turn our conversation to questions from the audience. So before we get to your work at, at, in Oklahoma as a whole, Terry, we want to talk about your work in Cottonwood. And before we even do that, I want to tell folks how, how we first met. Uh, this betrays me as a complete nerd, but one of the things I do when I have a little extra time is I kind of spelunk through state report cards and state data. Um, to find schools that are kind of interesting. And as I was spelunking through uh, the Oklahoma data, I, I stumbled on the data for Cottonwood 
uh, uh, Conwood Elementary. And so I'm going to show some of the data, uh, demographics of the school, and you can see uh, it's a third American Indian and another quarter multi-ethnic, and I think that's mostly uh, white and American Indian. Uh, about two-thirds low income. And I should say about when I was looking two years ago, it seemed to me it was closer to 90%. I think some of the oil fields have uh, reopened since the gas prices have, uh, the oil prices have up. Yeah. You have about uh, a little more than a quarter of your students are students with disabilities, which is about twice what the rate of the state is, and we want to talk about that a little bit. Um, so in, this, in the next slide, you'll see in reading, Cottonwood pretty much go, uh, outperforms the state at every grade level. And uh, I could show it by ethnicity, I could show it by um, income, and you would see also that the, the, that Cottonwood does quite well in reading. And in math, I'm showing this is the um, performance index that was used until 2011, and you can see. Cottonwood was outperforming the state as well. Um, last year, Oklahoma went to a report card system, and Cottonwood was one of, I think this is correct, or you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of only two high poverty districts uh, to receive an A rating. So I'm very intrigued by the data. And I called and asked if I could stop by um, on my way to a speaking engagement somewhere else in the state. The principal said that was fine. I drove to Cottonwood, just uh, uh, outside the town of Colgate in Cole County, about 120 miles southeast of Oklahoma City. And the campus is dominated by large steel free frame buildings, similar to the ones you would find on maybe a poultry farm. Uh, and Terry, when I got there, you were you were there as well as um, uh, as well as the current principal and superintendent. And you helped. You, three of you showed me around the school. Um, can you can you um, they heard about me here here here? The three of you were all walking over to the science building. Can you can you say why you came? Because by then you were already retired, right? Yeah, um, John Daniel, who is the superintendent uh, at the school, um, he called me and said um, there is a lady coming uh, that um, has done research on Cottonwood School, and um, she wants to know the history. And so I'd really like for you to come up because you are the history. So mm -hmm. I said, okay. Uh, and so he told me the day that he would be there. So when I came up, all I knew was some person had, was coming in and had done research and had been watching some things about the school. Uh, and so I just came up to answer questions that John wasn't the, to the answer because he was not there during that time. Right. So, so, um, so here we were walking to the science building. We're going to show what it looks like inside the science building. This had been the gym, and I, you, you transformed it to the science uh, to the science building. Is that right? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, uh, we decided that uh, there was a grant opportunity that came up, and um, so we made the gym it wasn't in the great shape anyway, and so but it was in great shape to make a science lab out of. And so we decided that to be able to house this equipment, we had to have a building, and it was the only building we had that would do what we needed to do. So we decided to transform it uh, into uh, basically a STEM lab uh, for three-year-old through eighth graders. And the kids played in the street um, instead of in a gym. Uh, for and that's a tough thing to do in Oklahoma, to take away the gym. Yes, uh, the <laughs> shocking thing. The shocking thing about it was, um, it, it looked like you know, not a great idea as far as you know enrollment and things like that. But the truth was, forty new students enrolled the next year, and that wow. really blew us so, away. So, I mean, this does not look like a standard uh, science lab. Um, I could do a whole hour on this, which we're not going to do. But I just want to just say that you have a really interesting science program. It's built around uh, 
computer units that students work through together um, in pairs, and it's actually quite hands-on. So the next slide is going to show the, um, the you know students working on building an electrical circuit, I think. But there's a whole range of things that students work on. They work on models of molecules and uh, mechanical uh, uh, um, six kinds of things. And it's a really interesting way of teaching science. And as I say, we could do a whole, a whole, whole, whole webinar on that alone. But, but uh, we're going to move on. We'll show a few pictures of what cotton looks like as we talk, as as the three of us talk. But right now, I, I'd like to uh, ask you a, to say a little bit more about Cottonwood. What was your experience? When did you arrive? Because you, you for a long time, you started as a teacher. Kind of talk us through what Cottonwood was like when you arrived and um, what it was like when you left. And uh, we can get so that our audience can get a little bit of a sense of, of why the state wanted you to do what you did at Cottonwood for, for the state. So um, when did I, you arrive? Okay, I received a call from one of the board members, and um, this would have been um, about 91, 1991, and um, they asked me to come take a look at what they were doing. I had uh, actually um, taught there uh, probably 10 years before that um, for a year. And um, anyway, we had moved to Texas, and I had come back, and uh, we actually owned a business, and I was teaching first grade in another district. And so um, anyway, I did not... Um, of a master's degree, and I did not have my superintendent's or principal's degree. And um, they called me and said, we just want to really visit with you about this. And when I went, they had failed the state test for two years in a row. And they were really looking for um to come in and help them rebuild. And so um, I told them no, that I didn't that's what I needed to do at all, and I sure didn't think that's what they needed to do. And so that kind of went on, uh, and then finally um, they said, look, look, you talk for a year. If you don't like it, it we understand. And so that's what happened is I um, went to school at night, and um, there was a man there that was the superintendent, and when I finished, he um, reached, and then I, I, I went in as superintendent. And so... Um, the school at that point, um, it had a lot of students that were older that had come there that um, they had been into behavioral issues, uh, just a lot of things. But the main thing that I kept seeing was that they had reading problems, strong reading difficulties, and they could not. Um, I remember having an older um, class of boys, and a lot of those boys could spell simple first grade sentences and when when I'm in a writing class. So I knew that um I knew where the bottom was as learning and literacy and I knew that we had to start there. So we began to as team and talk about our students and what had to happen. And because we were so low staffed uh, and money so tight um, I think at the point when I went in there, the whole um, operating budget was $306,000. And was one building, and um, there was a gymnasium. And the building, it was the cafeteria, the sled, the, the, um, the kindergarten through eighth grade, and all the offices and the library. And so we just started there and began to... Uh, meet as a team to say what needs to happen here. We saw the needs of the kids. Um, the teachers, they all know that it's hard to have a child in a classroom when they cannot read, and you're trying to do all of these other projects, and those kids can't, they can't speak, they can't write, they can't read. And so we decided to start right there and build the school and, and, and transform the literacy starting from the bottom to the top. And so we um, visited with our IO 
and and told him some of the innovations. You better, we, you better say what an RAO is. Well, he was our regional accreditation officer from the State Department, and we just said these are the challenges we have. This is the amount of staff that we have, and we've got to do this for each one of these kids. So basically, where the student was a student who'd been identified in special education wasn't the issue. We just took a look at every one of the kids and we measured where they were in reading and math, writing and spelling. And we made sure that during the morning hours that that's the classes that they got into was to, we had to fill the holes. And so um, we designed our schedule to where any one of those children, no matter what age they were, they were somewhere where the skill that they needed was being taught taught and monitored. So um, that's exactly what we did from the bottom to the top um, was make sure that strong literacy piece was um, foundationally sure in each one of those kids' lives. You talked to me once about starting from zero uh, and getting to zero. Can uh, I explain what you mean by that? Yes. Yeah, so basically when when, you know, when we look at a child, a lot of times, you know, we've looked at them as, as, well, this age, and so they should be in this grade doing this, this. But the thing is, every child is a unique individual. And so we don't know by all's age at all what it is they really are confident in doing. So um, we, when we would give them um, just quick assessments, we would find out where they were, and we started at zero. We had to see from zero on up in math and writing and spelling and reading, where where are they on the continuum of those foundational skills? And we came to the place where they were erupted in their confidence and being able to do it independently. We knew that was where we had to start. It's a really different approach than had been going on in the school previous to that. How did the Back to this this big change in instructional approach. The staff was absolutely thrilled because what they had had in, in place of this was driven, say in a fifth grade classroom, and they've got a textbook, and it you know they're supposed to be teaching fifth grade standards, and they've got kids that are ahead of that, and they've got kids that that even know um, first grade literacy. And so those teachers were, they're a very caring uh, group of people, and they wanted all of those kids to learn, yet they're just one person trying to meet all those various needs. And so it really took the pressure off of them. Um, they, in fact, they were part of the decision-making when we began to do this. You know, a good teacher knows where her students are and, and or his students are, and they all feel overwhelmed when they go home at night that they didn't get to this particular group of students. Let's focus on diagnosis and assessment of where students are. It was really positive for the teachers, but you said when you started there that um, you had been a teacher, um, but you didn't have principal or superintendent certification. How did you know what to do? How did you know how to help the teachers be able to do this? Well, I think the biggest part to me was um, I taught high school math when I first started. And um, so what ended up happening was I had kids in that classroom that they could not read. So I I knew that I was trying I was trying to teach algebra, but there was no way I I mean, the kids that they didn't have foundational skills of multiplication were missing addition, and right there I could see that what they learned previous to getting in your classroom depends on how far you can take that child, and so you've got kids if you've got 15 kids and you've got 15 levels. Just any child to learn in that classroom, it has to be on their level because they're really going to gain the most out of that class. And so um, I had also taught um, um, first grade, and I taught all, all up and down that line of you know, first um, through fifth grade. And 
um, seeing the differences there. And then I taught the sixth grade, you know, through the tenth grade and seeing the differences there. And I taught the gifted. I taught the remedial classes. I taught the regular classes. And the thing that really got to me was I tell that that's where we were missing it. What these kids didn't have the foundations that they needed to be in those classrooms. So, um, um, I one of the things that's really interesting, though, is that is that Kenwood has sort of twice the twice the percentage of students with disabilities as the rest of the state. Can you tell why that is, and what the? Um, yes, absolutely, yeah. Karen. So there's only 20 kids in our original district. And so we began to work. I said it was an itty bitty district. <laughs> it was. And we began to work on. We had 71 students there at the time. We began to work. Most of the kids had come, um, you know, by you know choice. But there were some that had come because they had been expelled from other schools or or were in trouble with other schools. And yet I felt like that anytime you put a child there, they don't have confidence. Especially the older they get, the worse they feel. And they are looking at um, public humiliation every day when they walk in that classroom. And so, like, you know, we had to find out how to help them and how to help them know that they could, that they weren't, there was something wrong with them. So I guess the word spread and then people just begin to come from all over. I to one parent, when I was there, one parent came uh, was there and talked to me about how his son, who was in first grade, the teacher had, in, in a different district had said, well, he's just not learning how to read and, and um, I'm not sure what to do. And he was kind of with his, at the end of his rope brought him from, I think it was a Toka, kind of 30 miles away, I think. Think not, yeah. I think it was a Toka or A, or I, I'm getting lost in the A um, uh, cities in, 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 in Oklahoma. <laughs> but um, uh, but he he said when one arrived at, at Cottonwood, fast and and the parents were told exactly sort of what the plan was from then on, and he had caught up. It sounded like two years worth of worth of reading in um, a very short amount of time. And you've said you think kids can catch up three, four, five years even in a year if they're given the right instruction. If they're given is, the is right instruction. Um, one of the things that I feel like that we, you know, were able to discover in, in, uh, is that, you know, we had a staff there, which I, I think this describes lots of staffs across the nation that really want want to help their kids. They really want to do a good job. But with the way that we set up school systems, especially if you have the dynamics that we did, you know, one teacher cannot meet all those needs in the classroom. So we had to do some out of the box things and one of the things that we knew we had to do was if we were to get the children in the right classes, we had to assess. And then we had to have the plan that worked. So um, a lot of times you'll have students that, you know, they they not learn to break the code in re reading. And so you're putting them in, you know, fourth, fifth grade, and they don't know how to break or decode. And so there's nothing there for them to be able to attack a new word. And so it just puts them at a place of, of a complete stall out. And they're gonna, most stu students are either going to be shocked and just hope nobody calls on them or they're going to act out. So, you know, I could see on both sides of the fence that the confidence to students who really know what they're doing, those are the kids that can start to dream about what they want to be in life. And all the rest of them are sitting there in those classrooms just hoping no one calls on them or just make sure that they can get through one more day. Right. So I want to, I want to transition. Um, I, I, Christine, I want to transition into your state role, but before we do, we have a couple of questions about what assessments you were using to determine the literacy levels, and um, what the what your um, you used any programs, if you uh, and and what kinds of professional development you you supported the teachers with. 
one of the things that we did was um, <clears throat> we did use um, um, there. We're here. Okay. Um, one of the things is we um, actually were able to, um, and we we went in with the literacy part with, with Dibbles, and we would assess, and it was like to me it was a, a thermometer that actually gave me um, what uh, if the child you know had anything wrong in reading, it would show up on that test, and then we would take diagnostic tests if if we could unlock it. Just by having the dibbles, then we would take a diagnostic. There's a test uh, called Literacy First that was very good in phonemes uh, and would help us, uh, you know, to assess that to see exactly what was going on there. And so um, we were able to um, help the kids know exactly what level of reading that they were on, and then we would place them accordingly. We had five or six different programs that we used there, and we had that many tests really that we used there and it depended on the child what test we used. And then another fallacy I think that happens, um, you know, we look at tests sometimes and we think they all do the same thing, but nothing could be far from the truth. You know, they all have certain things that you really need to measure and that's the reason that you use that particular test. Well that gives a sense of the complexity of, of the way you Think about reading, um, and and so, but we kind of trying to try and transition because we want to get to some other questions. Um, so Cottonwood became well known within the state, and you were asked to head the state's efforts the efforts in literacy and early childhood. Um, to give a little picture of the magnitude of the problem you are tackling, let's look at a little data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Um, you can see here in this slide, this is showing just fourth grade reading, and you can see over about the past decade, there really hasn't been much change um, for the state. So the state has been fairly flat um, in improving its literacy efforts. Um, and this contrasts rather starkly um, with the improvements in fourth grade math. Um, you can see the fourth grade math really improved pretty significantly from 2000 to 2007. It has since leveled off. It, it really is very different than that, that, that flat um, lack of progress in, in reading. Um, and the result in reading um, is that Oklahoma is considerably below the national average in reading. Uh, you can see where it is on this chart here. Uh, one in three Oklahoma fourth graders is considered below basic in reading. Uh, students of color are that much more likely to be below basic. So, Terry, when, when you look at this data, and I think you did look at this data when you were asked to take this position on, uh, what, what were you thinking? And when you look at this, what, what's the state's goal around literacy? Uh, if you can talk a little bit about the strategy you're using to reach that goal. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, I have, you know, when, by teaching first grade, I tell that when I had those graders come in at the beginning of the year, there were tons of differences in those kids already. So I knew that the quicker you started with those children remediating, the quicker they would come up to level. And, of course, research tells you that a first grader who is behind, you know, if not get the right intervention, those they will be behind in fourth grade. So... Um, there has to be strong intervention, and so basically, um, one of the places we are so fortunate in Oklahoma to have an early childhood initiative like we do. Uh, when um, President Obama was on the State of the Union address, he mentioned um, two models, and one was Oklahoma and one was Georgia, as far as the pre-K. So we have the perfect setup to cause the kind of change that we're wanting to do. So basically, if you begin to remediate in, um, say, pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade, you know, in second grade, you get about three times the gains that you would get if you wait till after that. Um, it's normal that a, an average child, even to your gifted kids, you're going to need about 80 to 90 minutes a day for reading instruction for them to gain at an adequate pace. And so you take a child that's a year behind, you have that 80 minutes 
that or 90 that you're doing that day, and you have to add another 80 or 90 somewhere in the day to make sure that those kids catch up with the year that they missed plus gain what you're doing that year. So um, old is that 95% of these kids. Research says that 95 to 97% of these kids can meet on grade level if given the correct interventions and the time. And that big, big portion right there, it takes time. Um, when you've got um, students that are a little bit behind, you that 90 minutes plus 30 to 45 more minutes a day um, to go in there and help them, you know, understand what it was that they were just a little bit off in in their reading. If you've got kids that are really struggling, you're going to need that 90 minutes plus about another 60 minutes. You know, sometimes another um, 90 minutes a day to catch them up. But the thing is, you set your mind to do whatever it takes. You you decide, you know, you find out where the child is, you find out where if they're on level or below level, and you start where they are and you start to build that. And a lot of the districts aren't set up in their schedules and with that kind of time. And where speaking is a natural ability, reading is not. Reading has to be learned. And so children play um, their ability to read in different parts of the brain. And where that ends up depends on a lot of times the time it's going to take to learn a certain skill. And so um, basically uh, we're trying to, uh, we have right now um, 35 to 40 percent of our kindergarten through third graders that are not reading on grade level, we hope to drop that to um, 3 to 5 percent that are not reading on grade level. And the key to me is to start at that pre-K level, um, find where those kids are, get the language essentials. That's the biggest part of reading is uh, the phonological awareness. If language skills are taught and, and learned by those students, that is 90 percent of the battle for reading. So you've outlined some really clear goals and some pretty ambitious goals that you have. We hear your confidence, which is really exciting to hear. But one of the things that you said as you were talking is that districts aren't really set up to provide the time necessary for the students to be able to, to catch up or to accelerate their learning. How are you working from the state to help districts be able to make those changes? Well, we have encouraged them to take a look at, at um, you know, what research says. And so um, we have 60 um, research coaches, which were some of our best teachers in the state. And we have divided the state up into 30 geographical regions. We have two research coaches in each one of the regions. And so um, Louisa Motes, who is a, one of the authors of Common Core, she wrote the Reading Foundations piece um, when we went to looking for models to um, set the state um, uh, personal development into, we saw this, and so uh, those Sea Reach coaches they come to um, the state capital there um, once a month right now and go through a week of training. And then they go provide this to their districts. There's 15 modules in this, and it's a methodology. It's not a program. It's a methodology on how to reach all children. It has this research behind it, the brain research, and it ties right to it is a piece of Common Core already. So with this one um, piece of intervention, we're able to hit the Common Core uh, at pre-K through um, third grade um, in the Reading Foundations piece plus um, give great professional development to all of the districts that are wanting to change some things. Those REACH coaches, they come from those areas, uh, live in those areas, and they're homegrown. And so they go around to the schools, and they anything from going into the classrooms and giving one-on-one -on -one modeling for the teachers to doing um, professional development to a group of teachers, to being professional development for um, a region. So, I, I, so a couple of things I just want to clarify for, for the audience. The Common Core standards, of course, are the standards that have been adopted by about 46 states that um, will be across uh, those states. They give kind of some clear direction 
in both literacy and math for instruction, which has never really been uh, the case across the country before. And Oklahoma is one of the states that has adopted Common Core. And um, there will be assessments uh, coming online over the next few years just to catch people up in case they, they weren't uh, used to that. And I also want to mention Louisa Motes, who, who um, did as one of the authors of the Common Core literacy standards, is a very well-known researcher in reading and has been for a very long time and has provided a lot of professional development across the country. Uh, so, um, I, I, so she has really provided a lot of the of the professional development for your reading coaches. So the knowledge and skill of reading teachers throughout the state. I mean, kind of laid out how that's gone. What about the, the leadership necessary to implement these changes? I mean, the the question of time is so crucial for schools, district leaders, and you, you raised it right you know, right up front. Kids who are behind need extra time. How are you bringing them along to understand these these time needs? There is, um, we do regional trainings across the state. We do it in 10 different areas across the state. And so we do an administrator's um, professional development within those, and we talk about this portion of reading. We talk about math, science, social studies, their role as an instructional leader. Um, this next year, part of our initiative for literacy is that we will um, be asking um, students and principals who want uh, a, a training in reading and reading foundations and how to transform their schools. They will be given an opportunity for once a month to come to professional development. Um, and actually, um, I will be helping to lead that professional development. It's interesting to hear you talk about your move from itty bitty school to the state level, um, but to hear a very similar strategy. You're talking about reach and evidence and then building the capacity and the will of staff to be able to, uh, to do work. Yeah, I think the belief system finally has to come down to um, what you would do for your own child, what you would do for your own grandchild. And um, someone wants to tell me that um, there was a cap on my child or a cap on one of my grandchildren, and I stopped there. I would keep going until I found the keys that unlocked what it was that they needed. I think we have to take that approach when we're looking at young kids or where we're looking at a grid or a district or a or a state or a nation. These kids can learn and we have to, we are the tools that can go in there and help them unlock these places. But we have to know first what we're doing and that's the reason we're putting high emphasis on the early literacy. We want the teachers to have the tools in their hand to be able to help these children unlock whatever door it is that seems to be closed. Uh, say the belief system, do you feel like the belief system is in place in Oklahoma? Do, do Oklahoma educators feel all kids can learn and it's up to them to teach? Or do I, they, are they more, you know, well, what do you expect? They come from poor families. They come from, from uh, you know, their families aren't helping them very much. So what do you expect me to do? Well, I've heard both sides. I've heard um, people that, um, when I looked at the letters modules, I saw the components of what done at Cottonwood. So it wasn't like, um, to me, um, allergy that I was not familiar with. I, I'd never seen it in one book before. And so <laughs> I was thrilled because I didn't want to plan and just go by my experiences. I wanted it to be broader than that for the state. But yet I saw, I saw what had happened. So it's not like anyone, uh, when you've had your own experiences in life, uh, no matter what someone tells you, you know the possibility that is there. and And basically... 
um, you've lived it. And so um, I was I heard both sides. I think our job is to encourage those people that um, believe that 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 there is um, race or um, more reasons why students can't learn. I think it's our job to destroy the myths and to um, put a no excuses bar on um, what kids can learn. And that whatever they're capable of doing, that we make sure that we are doing all we can to see them reach their very highest potential. That's uh, great to hear that it sounds like it's coming from the state setting this vision that all students Students can learn you that in your school and district, and you're bringing that to the state and really trying to find ways to do that through capacity building at the at the state level. And I think you know these uh, webinars uh, for us are really uh, sort of about the leadership necessary to do this work. And uh, I'm going to talk for a minute, but I want to say to our um, guests out there. Uh, this is your chance to write in some questions so you can direct the conversation to Terry. Uh, Karen, we're happy to keep asking questions, but we want to talk forever, <laughs> but you don't want that. Uh, but we really want you to have your questions answered, and so start sending them in, and we will um, ask those of Terry. But in the meantime, you know, just sort of hearing this conversation from Terry about how she learned to do what she did, she did and did in her school and is now working doing at the state um, really has brought to life. Um, issues that have been highlighted in the research findings um, that if we're going to make change at the scale we need, that is affecting thousands of schools, not just a few. We're going to need to understand the role of the principals in leading instruction. Um, we need principals and other school leaders to be knowledgeable about instruction. Um, and the research about the kinds of things principals need to know and be able to do is coming to consensus at this point. Uh, the Wallace Foundation um, has put together a succinct a succinct synthesis of a research and a publication uh, called The School Principal is Leader, and we have a slide up there um, sort of summarizing sort of the big findings about what leaders need to do, and I think the first one, shape a vision of academic success for all students, is really very much, Terry, what you're talking about, what you did at your school and what you're doing at the state, so talking about providing that, that vision. Um, that leaders need to do that within their own schools to take advantage of this capacity building that you're working on. You're trying to build the knowledge around literacy and how you go about building literacy skills, providing some of those tools through coaching, but also some of the assessments and diagnostic tools for, for teachers to be able to use. Um, but we really need that vision. That vision is primary in actually being able to, to get this work done. Um, you can also see some of the other um, skills are creating um, a climate um, that's biddable to education, cultivating leadership in others, and I think that's also part of your strategy that we're hearing about as well, uh, building um, literacy leaders uh, across across the state, um, having that leadership on that particular skill. Um, and of course, this is all about um, improving instruction. So it was great to hear as you talked about the work, really highlighting these ideas about leadership that the Wall Foundation has written about in their book, in their um, paper, and that we've also written uh, about in our book, and I think we have some questions coming we in, do. so we're so, going to start feeding them to you, Terry, so get ready. Okay. Quick fire. Right, so so one question asks um, about the role parental involvement played in the Cottonwood turnaround, and, and I, would, I would broaden that also to say, you know, what role do you expect parents at the state level to be playing in the improvement of the academic achievement of all kids? At Cottonwood, we um, had parents who, a lot of the parents had had very negative experiences in school, and um, but they wanted the very best for their kids. And so um, we were off of what we'd call an honor system. And we just wanted to make sure that those parents felt honored by us as the child's um, you know, provider. When they came into the school, whether it was financial or educational. And so we would um, pull in the parents and ask them what they needed from us. And then we would share with them, uh, you know, things they could do with their children. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention uh, a while ago is that every Friday um, we had professional development at Cottonwood. And so the kids So you would, close school a half day early? We, we closed it at 1 o'clock. And so it gave us 30 minutes to get the kids, you know, on the bus or, you know, um, 
to wait to go home. And then we met as a staff every Friday from 1.30 to 3. And parents were invited. If there were things that they wanted, we didn't, we had parent-teacher conferences you know, that were um, dates that we were supposed to, you know, from state mandates, but we had parent-teacher conferences anytime a parent could meet with us. And so anytime a parent desired to meet or we desired to meet, we tried to make sure that we kept in close contact with our parents. And um, they're amazing. The parents were amazing, and it is such a myth to believe that um, people um, – and I know there are times when parents do not want to get involved, but I think sometimes we can break those walls down um, with those parents that it, it appears that they don't want to get involved, but as soon as they feel comfortable, um, just the magic that begins to happen and begin to trust you and have the best interest for their child, uh, that's something you can share in common with those parents. And we saw a lot of parents come that people just would not have believed would have been interested. So you start with kind of a distrustful atmosphere, and you're able to build a trusting. Is, I mean, is that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that That's fair? That's exactly what it was, yes. And and it's hard to build trust with people that have been through a lot of things, but we would try to um, have um, activities that they could come enjoy their child. A lot of the activities that they'd been to at school, even when their children were involved, were negative. And it was hearing bad news. So we tried to build um, situations where they could come just enjoy. Like, um, I'll never forget us doing pre-K basketball games. And these are three- and four-year-olds that play basketball. And, you know, <laughs> those gymnasiums would just be full of parents that wanted to see that. And it was a fun experience. I think sometimes we've got to think of it like that. We've got to provide an atmosphere where people want to be there. And some fun. here's a, here's one of my. I'm really excited. Somebody asked this because I wanted to ask it myself. What happened in Cottonwood after you left? Have the scores been maintained? Did you personally so, select your successor? And if so, what did you look for? Um, my successor was actually a young man that I taught in third grade, and <laughs> that's what I love. I love this story. He is absolutely amazing. Uh, when I actually was his teacher in third grade, he was probably one of the smartest little boys I ever laid eyes on and had tons of energy and um, became actually um, a scientist, an environmental scientist, and worked in that field for 10 years and was excelling in that field and came back to me and, and told me that he felt like he'd missed his calling and um, he was making a great salary, <laughs> much bigger than what he made when he came to the school, and um, actually um, decided to come back and teach. And so um, he did come on, has an incredible heart for the kids and for the teachers and for the parents. And so um, that school has not gone down since I left. That school has gone up since I left. Um, I were telling people um, he had not purchased gasoline from the pump in 10 years. He makes his own. And I thought, <laughs> now this is uh, way out of my category here. And what am I doing running this school when this man makes his own gasoline? Anyway, um, he's just doing a tremendous job, and it's nothing short of what I thought that he would do. One of the things you told me was that you felt you had taken Cottonwood as far as you could I wanted him to take it farther, uh, particularly in science and engineering, which um, I, Frank, I'd like to do a whole webinar on the whole science and engineering program, and he, uh, have him do that. But, um, but, but you, you felt you had done what you could at Cottonwood, and you needed to pass the baton. Is that right? I did. I had laid a foundation. I knew um, in the reading, the writing, the spelling. Another piece that we had our own counseling center at our school because, you know, I told you our county was the highest in child abuse and child neglect. And a lot of times 
our children were suffering from things that had nothing to do with academics, even though it was showing up in academics. And I knew the parents, they were asking for help. So we actually set up um, a family counseling center there. And so I felt like the foundation was the whole child. And, you know, helping the kids um, learn what were good habits of um, eating and how you get along with others and, you know, when things go on in your life, how do you handle that to keep from, um, you know, getting to where um, the world overwhelms you and panic. And so I felt like we had built a strong foundation in the emotional realm for the children. And, and then I felt like we had built a strong foundation in the academics as far as the, the core academics. And I felt like that um, I had done everything that I knew to do, and I knew that foundation was very, very strong, and it needed to build higher. And I knew that John carried that. So I felt like that that was wisdom, was to back up and let him have it to carry it on. Uh, another question, um, and this one's a fairly specific question, um, and it's what first of all, it seems there is a lot of individual student attention since there are all potentially at different literacy levels. After the assessment and with a limited number of teachers, how did you implement this? And this is a really um, important question because it gets to your time question and talking about doing this across the state. So this is something that you're in yeah. all schools to do now. Well, I'm saying it's an option. Uh, so basically what we did was um, because of um, constraints as far as staffing, um, we knew what instructionally was going on in all of our classrooms during certain periods of time. And so from the pre-K all the way to the eighth grade, um, wherever a student um, was scoring and the weakness was, if it was not more than um, behind, um, we'd float them down and catch up with certain skills. Or we would float them up. Them down and put them in a previous grade level? Yes, so basically for that hour. So basically we had a math uh, at the beginning of the day for an hour and 10 minutes. And we had um, literacy, which is the reading, writing, and the spelling at noon. And we held that schedule completely through third grade. And so it gave those kids that were behind or ahead or on track a place to go. And it didn't. We didn't have to hire extra staff to carry that on. And so we did. We utilized a lot of teachers' aides that would be in the rooms with the teachers, the main teachers. And so it left the teachers to those students that were just, you know, flying. Things were going great. It left the aide to be able to, from the teacher's direction, go on with those kids and let them do some exciting things, looking up some things, and then it gave that teacher the time to go back. And work with those students who were struggling. So um, it worked very, very well for us. Now, am I saying that I'm telling all the schools to do that? No, I'm just telling that that is one option. There's many ways to adapt your schedule um, during the day to different ways of doing things, and that just happens to be the one we picked. Uh, our audience members wanted to hear you say exactly how you did. I know you're not telling people to do it, but some people like, tell us how you did it, so we can do that same thing. I think the other thing, um, I'm seeing some of the questions that are coming in. I think um, people are hearing um, people that this was very easy, this transition that you did at Cottonwood. It was easy to get everyone on board with the beliefs and, and make this change. So we have a couple of questions. Um, it's really saying, if it's not so easy, what would you do differently or what would you add in to help people get get on the belief system and to build this trust and respect and integrity that you created there? I just start with the staff was the number one um, priority, um, just to find the staff's belief system. You know, I remember um, at first um, most people are doing as much as they know how, and so when you start telling them something else to do, they feel overwhelmed because they, they're, they're thinking you're going to add it on instead of taking things off and put it in its place. And so um, once the staff begin to experience some of this, they were thrilled and they begin to tell people about it. And people begin to gravitate to it. And because of the 
believe I believe most people want whatever's good for their child. And so um, when they come to school and their child was miserable, and yet they start coming to school and their child is happy and their grades are coming up and learning to do things they didn't learn, it doesn't take long for word to get around. Um, so we're going to wrap up here in a minute, but we did have one um, detail question. Um, you mentioned the letters protocol or, or something like that. Can you share what that was? Okay, letters, um, the, actually the program that we did as a core curriculum, kindergarten through third, was avoid your universal literacy. And so um, it it really a literacy program that you could teach all day long. It had a lot of science built into it and social studies built into it and writing. And, and it's one of the things that people don't understand is that, that when you're learning to read certain words, your spelling words ought to go right along with that so that you're pulling from the phonological piece in your brain over to the orthography piece. And so you're 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 sounding it out and then you're reading it and writing it. And then it builds a bridge in there and there's your phonics. And then you can go on up and build your vocabulary and your comprehension on top of that. So that Voyager program was a lot like that. So when I looked at programs or methods that were out there, I came across this thing called letters and it's it's acronym. L, capital E, capital T, capital R, capital S. There's actually 15 modules, and it's language essentials um, for choices of reading and spelling. And so the author is Dr. Louisa Motes, and it is, it's, a, it's by the time teachers get this, our coaches, they said, oh my goodness, I wish someone had taught us this. We would have known so much more how to help our kids. So it's almost like a doctorate level of the deep things of reading. When teachers get these things in their toolkit, they feel so confident to help their students. Well, um, thank you, Terry. I think that we're going to have to wrap up right now and, and jump and do some closing business. Yeah, so I, what really strikes me is how fascinating it is to see how in, research intersects with real life experiences and we know from our work, as well as from other research, is that school principals matter a lot, and what they know matters a lot, um, particularly for poor children and children of color who aren't always well served by their schools. Principals, principals who believe that all children can learn and achieve and who work hard to help the teachers master the knowledge and skill necessary in the schools to help can really have an outsized effect in helping short circuit the effects of poverty and discrimination. So, you know, you, you're talking about yourself, the teachers, the district leaders, everyone plays a role in helping make sure that all kids learn. And so, uh, talking with you has really um, highlighted this idea, and it's been an amazing conversation. We really want to thank you. you. If everyone listening will register for the next and last of the webinars in the series. In April, we will talk with Sharon Brittingham, who transformed Frankfurt Elementary School in rural Delaware, um, and since retiring, has been working to support principals throughout the state. To register for that webinar, go to edtrust.org, and look for the box on the left-hand side of the front page. It's not like the most obvious box, so you're going to have to look for it. Um, and although Terry Brasheen was not at Brakeen, oh my gosh, I, I mispronounced your name again. <laughs> Terry Burkeen was not part of the study that resulted in our book, Getting It Done. Um, we hope anyone interested in understanding more about the beliefs and practices of It's Being Done school leaders will read our book, uh, available from Harvard Education Press and Amazon. And we want to thank the Wallace Foundation for supporting these webinars, which we're able to share them free of charge. And we hope, hope if you're interested in the issue of school and district leadership, they will go to the Wallace Foundation's website where they have a plethora of resources. If colleagues who think they should, that if you have colleagues who you think should have heard this webinar or if you want to listen to the whole thing live, the recording will be available in a few days to the website for the link. And we hope you will consider attending EdTrust 2013 conference. It's a unique opportunity to gather together with educators, policymakers, and advocates who are about improving academic achievement.
achievement for children, but particularly children of color and children of poverty. This year it will be in Baltimore on October 24th and 25th, and it should be another fantastic conference. I'm excited to say we have confirmed Vaughn Shepard as a speaker. He was our first webinar uh, speaker, and uh, we're still building the program, but he has confirmed that he will be able to be with us. Thank you again for attending this webinar, and we'll see you on Wednesday, May 15th at 4 p.m. Uh, for our talk with Sharon Brittingham. Thank you so much. Thank and you, Terry. Thank you, Terry, and enjoy your conference. We should have mentioned that you're at a conference and you joined us from your hotel room. We really want to thank you for that outsized effort. Well, thank you, and, and to all of those listening, I've read your books, girls, and it is fantastic, and it is the truth. <laughs> there you go. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar. You may now disconnect your lines.